Welcome to um, East Point's call with Kazu and Chris on what's nonviolence got to do with this all as part of our speaker series that started in March and is still going as we are navigating the month of July. I hope you're all well. <coughs> Welcome. For, the, for those of you who are not needed, please make sure that um, you stay needed during the call unless you're asking a question. I'm going to um, introduce our upcoming events as we're waiting for more people to join in. So I'm going to be sharing my screen. <coughs> It seems that my computer is not allowing me to share my screen. So I'm just going to be speaking about our upcoming events. So um, on Sunday, we have Samir Patel, who's offering some breathing work. Um, on July 23rd, uh, we have Sarah Bunting offering a nonviolence practice group, which is meeting every Wednesday starting, it already started. Um, and is offering a model of communication that allows um, nonviolent practitioners to look back on events and align nonviolent values with behavior. On July 28th, we have Mushi Mikeda um, with the event from What the Fact to Please Tell Me More, Skillful Speech in a Polarized World. And on August 10th, we have Victor Lee Lewis on the future of racial capitalism. There is none. So again, everyone, welcome. We're uh, here with Kazu Haga and Chris Moore Backman for our virtual event um, called What's Nonviolence Got to Do With This? My name is Astrid Montiplar. I am a core member uh, at East Point, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Theresa, who is a co-founder of East Point and a board member for East Point, and she will be introducing Kazu and Chris. So Theresa. Sending it to you. Unmute here. Thank you, Astrid. Welcome, everyone. It's really, I'm, I was just scrolling through looking at everyone. Um, so the, um, the topic uh, that we're all here to hear about tonight, what's nonviolence got to do with it? I'm probably wildly biased, but I think it has everything to do with it. And I was thinking today, it reminded me of a, a quote from a, a poet or a, a philosopher, most likely both from 14th century Japan, who said that all tempests like a navel has a hole in the middle through which a gull can soar in silence. Um, so the two panelists tonight, um, what can I say? Kazu, well, I've known you the longest <laughs> of the panelists. I don't mean the longest of everyone. <laughs> um, Kazu is our founder and a member of our core team. He has over 20 years of experience, even though he doesn't look it, um, in nonviolence, sort of uh, practices, training, and organizing. He is also, like Chris, a published author. Um, and uh, his book is Healing Resistance, a radically different response to harm. Turn around here. Uh, he, <laughs> um, Back out. I have somebody who needs, I have some, someone who needs to mute who's probably not aware that we can hear them. I, ho I hope they're not aware. <laughs> um, and his co-presenter, Chris Moore Bachman, who is also a member of our core team and also a published author. Chris wrote The Gandhian Iceberg, a nonviolence manifesto for the age of the great turning, perfectly timed, I would say, and um, has had a lot of experience, variety of experience in human rights, peace, social justice organization, and also served on the international peace teams for Colombia and for Palestine. Um, and without taking up further time, I'd like to turn it over to these folks. Chris, Kazu. 
Thanks, Teresa. Yeah, I really appreciate you being here. And Kazu and I sort of drew straws and uh, I won. So I get to ask Kazu the first <laughs> question. <laughs> Decided that we would, we would just spend this time in conversation, Kazu and I. And to start off, Kazu just wanting to invite you to share, sort of by way of introducing yourself to us, um, a couple of key landmarks for you looking back on your journey uh, up until this point in your life and in your work. If you could just give us a few, yeah, key sort of milestones along the way. Yeah, th <clears throat> uh, thank you, Chris, and to uh, Teresa as well. Uh, really good to be on this call. And uh, just real quick, I don't know if everyone saw in the chat box a message from Astrid that this call is being recorded um, and we'll edit it down and upload it to YouTube later on. Um, so just so folks know that it's being recorded and when we open up for Q&A, um, your questions will be on that video. Um, so just be aware of that. And, and if there's something that you say that you prefer not to have uploaded to YouTube, just uh, email us or contact us and let us know um, and we'll edit that out. And if you have any tech issues during this call, you can go ahead and, and uh, send a private chat to Astrid who will be managing the tech for us today. So yeah, um, really good to be here. Uh, you know, we've been doing uh, a bunch of these calls uh, since the um, shelter in place started and we figured it might be fun to have uh, Chris and I on. And now that I'm the speaker, I feel much less pressured to make it a formal thing because I'm such an informal person. <laughs> so this will be a fun, loose, informal conversation between Chris and I, but um. Yeah, I think a lot of folks know my story. Um, if you read my book, the beginning part was kind of mini memoir, but I'm one of those people that can point to like the exact moment that this thing all started for me. And that was on May 1st of 1998, uh, when I was 17 years old. And I was in a pretty rough place in my life. You know, I, I dropped out of high school when I was 15. I was drinking a lot. I was getting high every day. I was not doing anything productive in my life. And as I oftentimes talk about, I was at this place in my life where um, if I met a military recruiter, I would have gone off to war. If I had met a cult leader, I would have joined a cult. If I lived in a, a big, large city, I might have joined a gang. Uh, you know, it was just like whoever reached their hand out first, I was just going to gravitate towards. And luckily for me, uh, it was a group of Buddhist monks and nuns who were really committed to nonviolence and social change. And so I met this uh, group of Buddhist monastics, a Japanese order called Nipponza Myohoji. And they were organizing a walking pilgrimage. They were gonna walk from Massachusetts down the coast of New Orleans, and then eventually down the coast of Africa to retrace the Middle Passage. And they understood that the racism that we were dealing with in this country today is a direct result of the legacy of the genocide of indigenous peoples and the enslavement of African peoples. And if we don't go all the way back and heal that history, we weren't going to be able to address any of the issues going on today. And so you know, I was just a 17 year old hippie kid that never knew, did anything productive with my life. And I was just bored. And I heard about this pilgrimage like a, a, a week before it started. And I was like, oh, this sounds fun. It'll be a, a, something different, an opportunity for me to get out of town. So I decided to go on it for the first week and left home for a year and a half. Um, ended up going to New Orleans and then ended up spending a year living in their monasteries throughout South Asia, India, Nepal, Sri Lanka. Um, and that was my introduction to Buddhist practice. It was my introduction to nonviolence. It was my int introduction to social change, um, really like diving head first, you know? Um, and it's been an ongoing exploration ever since 20 years later. And I feel like I'm still trying to understand what this word nonviolence is and how it applies to my life and what it means to practice it and, and, and how to bring it out into the world. So um, that was clearly the, the biggest moment in my life. And, uh, you know, I know most people don't have these, like this one day that they can point to May 1st was the first day of that pilgrimage, but yeah, I want to turn the question back to you, Chris, and, and to see how you ended up where you are today on this call. Thanks Kazu. Yeah. I mean, I've heard, I've heard you share 
that before, but it, but it's always remarkable to me. And I, I always feel gratitude when I hear about those monks in particular, that that was the intervention that happened then and not the military recruiter. Um, yeah, I think everyone on this call is probably grateful for that uh, being the case. Um, and I, I just, I'm so pleased like looking at this beautiful array of faces and some just old friends I haven't seen in a while, a couple of my family members that I'm super happy to see. Um, so thank you for joining us. And um, one of those family members is my mom who's on the, on the call. And um, I wanna start by just naming that when I was a kid, I think maybe seven or eight years old as my guest, my mom and, and dad and a bunch of people from my church community took me and my brother and lots of other members of our church to Tijuana. I grew up in San Diego and we would go periodically to an orphanage in Tijuana and bring uh, clothes and food and games and things like that for the children in this orphanage. And I, I think perhaps the most formative experience in my life really happened on one of those trips when I befriended a young orphan uh, boy in this orphanage. And, you know, I just had that immediate kind of connection with him in the way that kids, kids can do just sort of love at first sight. Like we're friends now and we played soccer and ate lunch together in this little tiny kitchen in, in this orphanage. And, just enjoyed each other for the few hours we were there. And then uh, when it was time for me to, to go, when my mom came to me and said, it's time for us to go, my heart just literally broke in two. I was, I was so grief stricken, um, sort of beyond understanding, you know, the level of grief that I felt, but I remember my head pressed up against the window in the, in the station wagon that we had and just sobbing to be leaving this friend. And I think that on some deep level, I knew that there was something just horribly wrong about me returning to the comfort and security of, of my warm house with a refrigerator filled with food and all the medical care that me and my family needed and all the education and all of the everything that came with, with for whatever reason, the package that I was born into and leaving this child in a in a shanty town where people were living in homes made out of pallets and crates and cardboard boxes and um so i think that moment there was just this reckoning that there's something horribly wrong with with the world that things could be set up in this way and then fast forward i see jilda on the call here too our our mutual friend and sort of you know colleague in the work michael nagler um, taught a class that I took in, in uh, university in 1992. And the, the main focus was, was Mahatma Gandhi and his theory and practice of nonviolence. And at that point, I was flooded with the memory of that orphanage experience when I started to study Gandhi, because I, I believe that what happened for me was recognizing that what Gandhi was talking about, what he was attempting, was addressing that fundamental wrongness of the, of the situation in a way that I hadn't seen or heard before, but which I knew was, was really important for me to pay attention to. So those are two really important landmarks. And then Cosby, I wanna just acknowledge like a couple years ago when you and I connected, when I was about to move back to the Bay and realized, hey, we could start teaming up at East Point. And when you welcomed me into East Point, it created this opening for a whole new chapter in my, my life and work. Um, so just wanting to offer gratitude to you for that. Yeah, and so my turn again, I just, I want to invite you, Kazu, like, where do you want to start this conversation? What is non, what's nonviolence got to do with it? In 2020, I'm actually really excited to have this conversation with you, but I want you to like, kick it off where you feel led to. Yeah, um, let's get into it. And, and actually, before I do, I, I just want to share um, the the first nonviolence training, like the official training that I ever received, was um, not long after I 
came back from uh, spending a year living in monastery. And I believe it was at a, like this like punk anarchist uh, space in East Hampton, Massachusetts called the Flywheel. And it was facilitated by Joanne Sheehan, who at that point had already been like a movement uh, veteran of, of decades and decades. And she's actually, I see her on this call. So Joanne, can you just like unmute yourself and say hi real quick so you'll pop up on everyone's screen? Hi, Kazu. It's great to be here. Great to see you. Yes, I, I remember that training. You and Steve Tiberish both came to that training at the flywheel. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm thank very you. Very honored to have been. And then Kazu and I got to work together a couple of years ago um, organizing a gathering of trainers. So we've been able to see each other. And my son and other family members joined the um, interfaith pilgrimage of the Middle Passage up in New England. So we have a lot of, a lot of great connections. Yeah. as well as our commitment to nonviolence, and the monks who were brought to the United States by the War Resisters League, who I work with. So that's how that group of monks came to join the Continental Walk for Disarmament and Social Justice in 1976. So. Thank Great. you. Yeah, Thank I just you. wanted uh, everyone to, to see your face and, and hear your name just because of, of uh, you know, you were obviously a, 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 an instrumental part in, in, in my path as well. And um, yeah, just in terms of where to start with this conversation, uh, you know, I, I was sharing, and, and I've written about this too, th that that moment in my life when I was 17. Uh, a lot of people know that I do a lot of work in prison right now. I've actually spent the whole day like responding to all these letters that we're getting from incarcerated people that we work with. Um, and it's it's funny because I oftentimes think about how had I not met those monks, and had I met a military recruiter, I would have gone off to war. At that point, I didn't even have a GED. I was completely lost. I probably would have come back from war if I made it back from war with like trauma, PTSD, and I may have uh, become a prison guard, right? Because that's a very like common path for people coming out of the military, especially if you don't have a college education and all these things. Um, and at the same time, instead of uh, meeting a military recruiter, if I, if I just like stayed on the path that I was in in that moment, I could have easily ended up in prison as well. So like as I do this work in prison and, and do restorative dialogues with prison, I've also done trauma healing workshops with prison guards. Like I think one of the things that nonviolence reminds me is how similar we all are and how we, we live in such a polarized world now and we look at the people on the so-called other side and we look at them as if they're another species and it's like there's nothing i have in common with them there's nothing i can learn from them um the, the, i could never be like those people and my life experience shows me that that is not the case at all that we are all so human together and i think so much of the the kind of ethos of nonviolence is about this unwavering faith in the idea of interdependence, right? That we live in an interdependent world. Dr. King spoke about that all the time. And how, you know, I, I sometimes talk about how amongst social justice activists, we like to, to think about and, and give lip service to solidarity and give lip service to justice for all people and liberation for all people. But we so rarely mean all people, right? That sometimes that we think that the universe weaves separate webs of interdependence based on our political affiliation, that my liberation is bound with the liberation of the people that I agree with, but fuck those people over there. And I don't think that's how it works. And I don't think that's how it can work. Right? We either believe in collective liberation or we don't. And so, you know, I, I think a lot about that in a time when things seem so polarized, where we feel like we have nothing in common and the only way I can achieve justice and liberation is by beating those people over there. And even in so-called nonviolent movements, it's like, how can we use nonviolence to leverage power so we can shove power down their throats? And I just, I, I don't think that we're ever going to achieve liberation that way. Um, one of the guys that wrote to me from Soledad Prison, he sometimes says that 
resolving a conflict is about fixing issues and reconciling a conflict is about repairing relationships. And to me, if we're not working on repairing relationships, then there's always going to be conflict. So, you know, a lot of what I think about right now regards to nonviolence is, is how can we build powerful movements that have the power to stop the systems of injustice in its tracks, but also with a commitment to healing relationships. Like, what does that work even look like? So I'm curious with that to throw it back to you, Chris, like what does that look like to be able to build movements that have the power to stop injustice, but also are working on healing and transforming relationships? Yeah, two acknowledgements as I kind of field your question. One is I, I have to chime in and acknowledge you as well, Joanne. My book is based on the three-part Gandhian, you know, description that you shared with me, I don't know, 25 years ago, and that I wrestled with and lived into my understanding of for all that time. And just wanting to, like, thank you, you know, for sending me on that journey, which has been so important to me. And for everyone, I just want you to know, Joanne was like the starting point of what became this thing, the Gandhian iceberg. And obviously you found it somewhere else, but you were the, the bridge yeah. for me and so many others. So just wanting to acknowledge Great. you. Thank you. And, and Kazu wanting to acknowledge you and your book, um, thanking you for, for bringing the, this emphasis on healing. You know, resistance work as healing work. I think that's a, a huge contribution um, to the community of people who are, are interested in, in nonviolence and trying to practice nonviolence. I think for me, one of the things that is, is crucial is to make the distinction between nonviolence, you know, in answer to your question about, you know, how do we, how, how do we enact this kind of healing impulse in movement spaces, in direct action spaces, and to me, it's, it's really important that we come to grips with the fact that nonviolence is much more helpful to us when we think of it as a verb than as a noun. I've found that a lot of times folks want to talk about whether or not a particular thing is nonviolent or violent or how nonviolent it is or how violent it is or to think of themselves as a nonviolence practitioner, or like I'm sort of part of this camp that's with nonviolence. And I feel like it's, it's much more helpful for us to think of nonviolence as an activity. It's something that we can do. And it's the kind of thing that you're either doing or you're not. And when we're doing it, yes, we're practicing nonviolence, but when we're not, it's important to just be real about that. And so for me, it's been actually a really, I think, healthy and humbling kind of experience over the course of my, you know, growing up, which I'm still doing, to recognize that the default of my ev everyday life is shot through with violence. Just being in, in this body, in this society, the mess that we find ourselves in right now makes it almost, if not entirely impossible for me to practice nonviolence in anything approaching purity. And there's actually something to me very liberating about accepting that as true, because then the question becomes, given that, how can I still try to inject nonviolence, which is synonymous with love, for me and many into this situation. Accepting that then that becomes this kind of awkward and humbling mix of violence and nonviolence, which I honestly think is the best we can hope for right now. Because when we're, when we're honest, we're, we're a civilization that's committing ecocide. So for us to have like philosophical debates about what's violent and what's nonviolent, when that's when that's the actuality of what we are collectively doing and have been doing for decades, sort of the absurdity of the philosophical debate, I think comes to the fore for me. 
And then it becomes that much more kind of down to earth question. How can I inject love into this situation right now? And I'll just say one more thing before kind of throwing it back in your direction, which is to acknowledge another person on this call, Nirali Shah, who is one of our speakers a few weeks ago, who I think is bringing another really key part to this conversation. Nirali, thank you for your emphasis on beauty and paradox and eros um, of of bringing like the, the fullness of our, our human experience into the action we take. Kazu, you've spoken eloquently in your book and in our workshops about the fractal nature of change, how what we do at the small level is what it becomes reflected at the larger level. Adrian Marie Brown is also, you know, speaking about this a lot. And it's, it's kind of a riff off of Gandhi's be the change that you wish to see in the world. So I would just like ask the question when I think about that, if beauty isn't part of the thing that we're setting in motion, then I think we're in trouble because what we want to see come out of all of this is something beautiful and whole. And so I just offer that kind of in response to what you were saying. I think that beauty is a really key part when we're thinking about how to respond and how to organize ourselves in a meaningful response to take that into consideration in a way that I think movements too often think, oh, that's, we don't have time, you know, for that. And I think we actually really need to take time for that. So kind of along those lines, and you can go wherever you want, Kazu, but I have been thinking a lot about the fractal nature of transformation and what you've said about that and invite you to share on that more if you, if you wish. Yeah, thank you. Um, so much I could say. And, and also just noting that there's so many more people we could shout out on this call. Right? It's really cool to see everyone's names here. Um, yeah, you know, I've the last, I don't know, five or six years of my life, I've actually have been less engaged in direct action work and the um, like social change movement building work. Um, there's been moments, of course, you know, Chris and I were both in Standing Rock and, and, at, and the, during the initial kind of rise of Black Lives Matter, I was very active. But for the most part, I've been spending my time in prison doing a lot of healing work and trauma healing work and restorative dialogues between people who have been harmed. And in doing that work, I've learned a lot about what it takes to heal relationships between two people. And the work of restorative justice and the work of, of repairing relationships between two people who have been harmed through, you know, the homicide and, and, and extreme cases of violence never happens by othering, right? It never happens by like going to the person who caused the harm and saying, you're a criminal, you're a bad person, we need to shut you down. And at the same, like, we all understand that. I, I think even without having gone to a restorative justice training, we all like intrinsically understand that. But when we extrapolate out to social level, like social scales, that's what we do to try to create change, right? We try to shame people into transformation and we try to shut down the other side saying, you're the problem, when we would never do that in a restorative dialogue. And so a lot of what I've been thinking about, what we've been exploring at East Point with Narali, is like, even like, I, I've been thinking about like, how, what would it look like if we use nonviolent direct action as a modality for healing collective trauma, right? Like one of the things that I learned on that pilgrimage when I was 17 years old is that every single person that lives in this country have a part in holding collective trauma. Like as a nation, we can't experience something as gross as genocide and enslavement without that uh, manifesting as collective trauma that gets passed down from generation and generation. And it's not just with people of, of, of African and, and, and indigenous descent, right? Like being a slave owner destroys your soul. Right, like being the, the, the side that causes harm. And this is the same in, in when I work in prisons, like for every person that has committed harm, there's an incredible amount of trauma that is associated with having caused another person harm. 
And so everyone, like collectively, this country has trauma. And so what would it look like if we were able to use direct action as a modality of trauma healing? And one of the things that I noticed is, you know, in, in nonviolent theory, we talk about how the more escalated the level of violence is, the more we have to escalate our nonviolent response, right? Telling someone who is about to like lose themselves and kill somebody that everything's gonna be fine, just take a deep breath, might not be the appropriate response. And filling out a petition for the Black Lives Matter movement is not the appropriate response, right? We need to escalate our, our responses and at the same time, in my experience, I've noticed that the more we escalate our nonviolent tactics, the more we escalate our polarization and the more we escalate this us versus them worldview. And it's that us versus them worldview. It's that polarized binary worldview that is destroying this planet. And so what would it look like? Like, what are the things that we need to be doing on our own, our own healing practices, our own spiritual practices, as well as what are the practices that we need to be adopting in our movement spaces so that we can escalate the tactics to match the incredible high levels of violence that we're witnessing against black and brown communities, against the earth, uh, against non-binary folks, against all of these communities, against all of us, while doubling down on healing, right? So, so I know that for myself, I really had to look at, like, if we're asking society to, to go to the darkest places and heal the wounds of the enslavement of African peoples and the genocide of indigenous peoples. Like we're asking this country to have a conversation about like the, the original sins, like our, the, the original core traumas, right? And so what am I doing to look at my original sins, my core traumas, like all of my childhood traumas, if I'm not working on the thing that I least wanna work on in my life, and the things that I at least want to talk about, then I'm not in a position to be able to hold that conversation with the world, with society, right? So I, I, I think part of the work of nonviolence is really looking at the ways that we carry violence within ourselves. Like we all have childhood traumas, and you know, what, uh, I'll kind of wrap up with this and 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 uh, pass the baton back to you. But in our work in the prisons. There's a, a great quote from Stacey Haynes that says, shame derives its power from being unspoken, right? We all have things that we feel shame around. And when we don't know how to speak directly to it, it ends up running our lives. And so in a lot of the trauma healing work that we do on the inside, a lot of it is about creating spaces that are safe enough for people to talk about the things that they are most ashamed of and to know that they can say that I did this thing or I experienced this thing and to know that they're not going to get thrown out of community, out of beloved community for, for, for saying that, right? And what we're trying to do is to have that conversation with this nation, right? This nation should be ashamed of its legacy of slavery and should be ashamed of the legacy of the genocide of indigenous peoples. And we somehow need to create a container where this nation feels safe enough to go directly to that place and to be able to own, yes, we come from a legacy of enslavement. Yes, we come from a legacy of genocide. And how can we own that and still have faith that we're gonna be part of this interwoven web of humanity and, and, and still have a place to belong on the other end of owning that? Because that's what accountability is, is it's, it's being able to own all of our stuff. And so, you know, I found that it's important for me to learn to speak to the things that I am most ashamed of so that I can be part of a process of holding that conversation on a larger level as well. And so, yeah, again, you know, take that where you will, but I'm curious to hear from you, Chris, like what are the practices that you do individually or that you wanna see in movement spaces that can give us the capacity to go to, to that kind of place. 
yeah. I can't help but think of a book that um, I'm guessing a number of you have read or have heard about, which is this fascinating book, Our Grandmother's Hands, uh, by Resma Menachem, who's a trauma healer and therapist who um, I, I feel like is just doing incredibly groundbreaking work, uh, healing work that has to do with white body supremacy and the impacts that it's had on those of us with white bodies, those of us with black bodies, those of us with police bodies. He, he spends particular time looking at those folks and, and those of us in whatever body we inhabit that we have, we have taken on trauma um, that comes down generationally. Um, and it's a fascinating book in that he's, he's really posing a challenge that I think relates very much to what you're talking about, Kazu. Um, because to do what you're, what you're describing, you know, to have that kind of reckoning with, with what our legacy truly is as a nation requires not just some kind of political shift, it requires a deep cultural shift. And what Menachem is, is arguing is that we need to build cultures of healing. And so I think this relates to this question about what's nonviolence got to do with it. And it, and it has, it also relates to the question of, well, what does social action have to do with it, period? I think that, well, I'll just speak from my own experience, that when I'm in movement spaces with groups that, that are considering things like direct action and trying to make shifts through direct action, through social engagement, there tends to be a focus on the system that we're trying to subvert, dismantle, replace, and those systems tend to look like government or corporation. But I think a key part of what we're learning is that the culture also needs to be shifted. And perhaps it's a, it's a precondition for the other shift in a way that we haven't fully accepted. And so when I see projects that are, are taking on the cultural work in a powerful and, and beautiful way, I, I find myself getting really excited because I think that paves the way towards the, the direct action that's actually going to help turn the tide with those systems. A couple of examples, um, the Red Rebel Brigade that is sort of a adjunct to the uh, Extinction Rebellion movement, street performers who evoke grief in public spaces in a profound way. The, the import of Red Rebels here has been problematic for various reasons. It, it's, it started in the UK and, and it's, it's, been a, it's been a little bit complicated here, but it doesn't, that's sort of beside the point I'm making, which is that that kind of embodied culture shifting, beautiful expression in public spaces in tandem with, joined at the hip with direct action is really exciting to me. And I've, I've been in those spaces and have felt what it's like to, to be on the receiving end of, of that energetic shift that happens. It's a culture shifting thing. And just wanting to acknowledge too that there's a group here in the Bay Area right now, a group of white identifying people who have launched a reparations procession, which is a 40 day process of, of mourning and returning where folks are walking nine miles every day from the Berkeley Shell Mound to Fruitvale Plaza, or Fruitvale Station where Oscar Grant was killed. And it's a process of embodied mourning. It's a penitential daily walk in silence. The lead mourner wears a veil, everyone's dressed in black. And it's, it's a beautiful thing to witness. And it's combined with a call to the white community to offer reparations. And so there's a GoFundMe page that's working in tandem with this daily pilgrimage. Again, this is just an example of a different way of thinking about direct action. We wouldn't maybe call that direct action because it doesn't involve civil disobedience, but it involves disobedience to the culture that, that 
puts limits on our understanding of what's possible for us as human beings. You know, that, that's what I feel like is, is so profound about it. And, and I hope is creating a pathway to new forms of direct action that can reflect that same work of bringing ourselves into a, a, a more sort of beautiful um, acceptance of our potential as human beings when we live into the fullness of who we are. And so the grief, beauty, um, all of that is, th those are parts of, of our movements that we haven't, we haven't brought in enough. And I, I feel like that's crucial to the work that you're describing. So Kazu, I'm just kind of noting the time. I wonder if maybe one more sort of quick back and forth. Does that, does that seem? Yeah, where do I want to, where do I, if I have one more question for you. And we'll get into small groups after that, so. Yeah. Well, I guess, you know, I, I sort of started with this, with this theme of nonviolence as a verb. And it reminds me how you and our workshops have talked about, you use the analogy of nonviolence as a martial art. And I wonder if maybe you want to share a little bit about that and how that may relate to, to this conversation that we're having now about the relevance of nonviolence today. Yeah, so, you know, I've been um, uh, and somewhat controversial. I'm a fan of mixed martial arts now. Um, not the most nonviolent thing in the world, but it's how I have some semblance of balance in my life. <laughs> um, and, you know, as Chris was saying, like, I, I think it's, it's dangerous to look at nonviolence as like a thing. Um, either a thing to become or, you know, I, I oftentimes talk about how uh, when I started doing nonviolence trainings, I had this understanding that when I started facilitating them, I had a very shallow understanding of it initially, of course. And I was basically under the impression that, oh, we can ask people to come to a two hour nonviolence training before going to a major demonstration. And that's what nonviolence is, right? But I realized that, you know, nobody has ever gone to a two hour or two day or two week karate seminar and then walked away being like, being like, Oh, I understand what karate is. I never have to train in it anymore. Right. That's not that like, a, that's a silly thing to think about. And, you know, similarly, like, even if you have been going to karate practice for 20 years, you never become karate. Right. Even if you meditate every day for 50 years, you never become meditation. It's not a thing to become but it's a practice that we're engaged in every single day and a muscle that we're trying to build and getting stronger and stronger every single day. And I think it's dangerous when we think that it, it, it's just a thing that we become like, oh, we've arrived there. I'm a nonviolent person. Therefore, what? We don't need to keep practicing it. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think it's important for all of us to, to look at nonviolence in that way as, 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 as um, yeah, just something that we never have to stop training in. And so, yeah, I know it's, uh, we want to get into small groups. So uh, I'll hand it back to, to Chris and, and just curious to hear your thoughts. And again, you know, take it in any way. But uh, in Chris's book, The Gandhian Iceberg, he talks about the, the kind of threefold approach of um, self purification or the personal transformative work constructive program which is about building the institutions that we need to take care of the needs of our own communities and satyagraha or the political resistance um part of, of organizing and i've heard you talk about chris how um according to gandhi the work of political resistance was the smallest part of the work which is why in your analogy it's it's it only represents the tip of the iceberg but i've also heard you talk about like because of the heightened level of violence that we're witnessing today, we actually need to be engaged in direct action work even more. And so I'm wondering if you can just talk about like the urgency and maybe the opportunity of this moment. Like what are you seeing in this, in this moment today that, that uh, and, and how should we be called to respond? Yeah, thanks, Kazu. Um, yeah, I want to just kind of point out that kind of within that description of Gandhi's um, sort of approach and maybe the prioritization. I mean, I, I Gandhi, I believe, argued it's all essential, 
But what he talked about was how the, the self-purification, that's the ground from which it all comes. If, if, if there is a fractal nature to transformation, then we ourselves are the instruments that we're using to facilitate that transformation. So we need to be tuned accordingly, you know? And the constructive program where Gandhi said was, it was, it, it was just like 90% of where he wanted the energy of, of the people to be putting, you know, to be put. Um, and Satyagraha, the direct action, he said, was something that you resort to when constructive program is impeded. So as we're building the, the nonviolent society we long to live in, when empire gets in the way of that process, then we turn to direct action to meet that challenge. And so what I, what I argue is that for, for a very long time now, our constructive program has been so impeded, but we've been in denial or just in a, in a state of unknowing of how impeded it is. So much so that, as I said before, collectively, we're committing ecocide. The system is set up in such a way where the building up of a nonviolent society is obstructed so much that we're actually destroying life. We're destroying the Earth's life support system. And so I've noticed that a lot of people are really excited about constructive program because that honestly, it's kind of the fun part. It's where we build the stuff in, in the community and work together to, to, to shape things in the way that really meets our heart's longing. But my sense is that we really do need to move into direct action enormously to get those blockages out of the way so that we have a chance at a livable future. And the way that I'm thinking about direct action right now is, is itself evolving dramatically um, in relation to what I was sharing before about culture shift and beauty and injecting into the action what we actually want to see, which I think is totally harmonious with what you're talking about, Kazu, in terms of not projecting our enemy images onto anybody. No exceptions if, if we're talking about beloved community, which I believe is also synonymous with nonviolence, then that means we recognize that we're all broken vessels in this. We're all complicit in the mess we're in. And so pointing fingers and, and that enemy imagery is not serving. So the direct action that's needed, I'm personally most excited about the culture shifting work because I think it's teaching us what's needed to generate the kind of presence we want when we're face up with those systems. The other last thing I'll say is that I think that the convergence of COVID and the uprisings in the wake of, of George Floyd's murder has offered us a profound opportunity to embrace a level of collective transformation that I haven't seen in my lifetime. And I think I think a lot of people are embracing that and, and actually feel more alive now than they did before. Um, and I just wanna name that in terms of, of this opportunity now, I think it's, it's an incredible one. And, uh, I, and Kazu, I just wanna, I'll just end by saying, I'm, I'm really grateful to be a teammate with you at such a moment and to be in company with, with everyone on this call during this incredible time to be alive. So small groups, we want to give you all a chance to, to connect with each other uh, as well. And then we'll come back and have a uh, question and answer time. Um, and our thought here, Kazu, chime in if, if I leave anything out, was, was simply to just have you get in small groups, I think of three, maybe threes or fours, depending on how the numbers work out. And to just share with the people in your room, um, your breakout room, uh, what came up for you as you listened in Kazu and my dialogue? And perhaps what questions are you sitting with, um, you know, as, as, you, as you come into that space with your small group? Sound good? So Astrid, I'll, yeah, just tag you to orchestrate the small groups. And then um, I think we'll, we'll spend 
how long did we decide, Kazu? 10 minutes or so. 10 or so minutes in the small groups, and then we'll come back and have maybe 20 or so minutes of, of Q&A. Thanks, everyone. Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for still being here with us. I see you, Kim. <laughs> We're going. Um, so before we go into uh, Q&A time, uh, I'm going to be speaking a little bit about gift economy, which is uh, a very important part of East Point's work, an alternative to capitalism. Um, I'm going to be sharing my screen. Those, a lot of you have seen these slides before, um, but I guess I, we never feel too um, tired to talk about gift economy in the ways that we do. Um, gift economy is the idea of uh, moving from transaction to cooperation. And at East Point, all of our programs are always completely free, which means that anyone who wants to join can join. And uh, oh, that was not what I was trying to do. I was trying to, here. And so um, the, re the reason why we're doing that is that we really believe that everyone should have access, as you can see in number two, uh, to the contents that um, we try and deliver to our community. It is done in a spirit of generosity with full recognition of our interdependence. And so we, we hope that the knowledge that you take in um, as you join our events will allow you to move into this world and continue building the beloved community. Uh, it's a very intentional work that really uh, puts forward equity and transparency and faith. Uh, we've never charged a single dollar for the, um, the content and the offerings that we've offered. And in the spirit of transparency, we do want to share that our expenses last year were around $120,000 and close to $100,000 were coming from our community. Um, so we really rely, we've been relying on community support. One excellent news that came in earlier this week is that the Catalyst Foundation has been uh, awarding us a grant of $100,000 per year. Yes, <laughs> so it's a really great uh, thing for three years. And so we're immensely blessed by the generosity of the foundation. Uh, the funds will be coming in in October. So until then, we still rely heavily on our community to pay the bills. And so if you feel called, um, to support us and support the people that not only are like here on these calls, but also the people that uh, we support and uh, bring nonviolence to including incarcerated populations. Um, you, can, um, you can just donate as much as your heart wants to donate. It's a really, it's a practice of feeling deeply into your own needs and knowing our needs, what feels right for you to offer. Um, and we, every time, give you this little quote, um, when giving is done out of pure joy, you can't tell who the giver is and who the recipient is. And so feel free to support us as your heart feels called to. And so with this particular event, we have a special link um, set up, which is at eastpointpeace.org slash kazuquizdonate, um, which you can also find on our website. So having said that, and thanking you for your attention, uh, attention and intention. Um, I'm going to give the mic back to Kazu and Chris for some time for Q&A. Um, again, if you have uh, questions, you can either put them in the chat, you can raise your hand. Uh, the raise hand button should be in the participants tab that you can click at the bottom of the screen. And um, yeah, Chris, Kazu, maybe you can just call um, on people as they raise their hands. Yeah, and before we do that, I um, just want to make a, a, a little note. Um, one of the things that we've noticed in our workshops, particularly since COVID and as we move like everything online, is that we're actually seeing um, less and less participation, particularly from black and brown communities on our calls. I think some of that has to do with access. Um, and so, you know, I think it, it particularly given everything that's going on in the world today, we really want to prioritize hearing from those voices. So we're actually going to uh, engage in a practice where we're going to invite 
people who identify as black indigenous or, pers or, or, or a person of color, um, if you have a question or comment first, then we're gonna actually hear from them first um, and then we'll open it up to everyone else. And this isn't to like pressure those who identify as POC to come up with something to say. If you don't have anything, that's of course, uh, that's fine too, but we wanted to open it up to you all first. So yeah, to see if there's any questions from those of you that identify as a person of color. And again, if you do, you can enter it into the chat. You can just say into the chat that you have a question or you can use the raise hand feature, which is in the participants menu. So let's give it a few seconds. And Chris, I don't know if there's something uh, in our break, you said that there's something else that you wanted to mention real quick. So maybe you can mention that to see, while we wait for a question. There was something I mentioned. Yeah, just about the action and an action. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, I, Kazu and I were discussing like, was there anything that you wished you had said that you didn't, you didn't say? And I'll just, I'll just share that for me. Um, I've actually enjoyed sort of a break from the debate about violence versus nonviolence. Um, it's a debate that I, I actually hear less of these days and I'm, I'm finding that to be nice. And the, the conversation that feels so much more meaningful to me right now, and which I believe is completely overlapping with the violence versus nonviolence question is action versus inaction. That to me, that's, that's the more kind of fundamental question for us right now. And it, for me, it relates to an experience I had um, when I worked in a domestic violence shelter for a year or so of coming to grips with how incredibly harmful the form of violence is that, that is known as neglect. And I feel like there's a way in which we have not reckoned with how far reaching and, and harmful neglect has been within the nonviolence community. And that goes back to the last question you asked me, Kazu, about the importance of Satyagraha. That I actually believe not taking action in the face of injustice is a form of violence. And I just wanted to, to name that as, as a, to me, a much more juicy conversation to have, action versus inaction, instead of the violence versus nonviolence. So maybe we'll open it up to the wider circle. And I remember years ago, I was at a, um, a Buddhist retreat and the Reverend, uh, Reverend uh, Angel Kilda Williams, who many of you may be familiar with, after she gave her Dharma talk, she opened it up with, uh, by saying, okay, who's got some answers? So it does, like Q&A doesn't have to be a question for us. If you just wanna share a comment or a reflection, you're welcome to do that as well. So invite anyone to raise your hand or enter something into the chat. And as that comes in, um, I'll, I'll just share that, you know, when, when I was like most heavily involved in the violence versus nonviolence debate was during the Occupy movement. And I remember at that moment saying a lot to anyone that'll listen, uh, the debate that I wanna have is what's effective versus not effective. Because when we start to ask that question, then it forces us to be really clear about what it is that we're actually trying to do, right? And oftentimes movements don't think enough about that. And, and if our commitment is to healing, then obviously we know what's gonna work and what's not gonna work. Um, and so it, it really forces us to ask uh, what it is that we're trying to accomplish too. So I see Elaine's hand. So Elaine, if you wanna unmute yourself and... And then we'll hear from Leedson after that. Elaine, can you hear us? I'm trying to unmute you. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, sorry. Uh, I'm in Seattle and um, recently um, I've been staying home mostly due to COVID. And one of the ways that I 
try to keep up on what's going on in in the street is through uh, Facebook uh, live streaming citizen journalist Omari Salisbury. And a while, I, I heard him share so powerfully about his experience when that famous, probably most people have heard of the area in Seattle called the CHOP where uh, the people took over a section of the city. But there was a lot of struggle going on there. And um, of course, it was very challenging. And um, after, now more recently, after that's been disbanded and, and shifted around, um, people have been, I guess, showing up, offering support, offering help, NGOs or churches, I don't know exactly who. But his, his strong comment was, where have you been? That we, we needed you to help us, help mentor us, help support us, to bring skills of resolu conflict resolution during that time of the CHOP. And, and nobody came. And so these rather young, largely, may, I don't know how experienced they were, but they were young, probably leaders, were left to try to figure it out. And I just felt so convicted, I guess, um, by that plea that was passed of where were you? <laughs> and um, I guess I take that now as seeing how needed the skills are from people that believe in nonviolence and that how can we be prepared to actually act <laughs> in times I mean, I, I can understand why some people wouldn't show up because they wouldn't have felt safe, but still, um, it was an opportunity that was missed, but hopefully there'll be more. <laughs> Thank you. And that's a comment that I, I, I feel like I hear in almost every kind of movement moment. Like I remember during Occupy, that was a big question too, because um, I think a lot of communities of color you know, one of the reasons why I think some people of color weren't as involved in Occupy was because I heard a lot of people say, well, like, this has been our life for 400 years. Like, welcome to reality. Where have you been for the last 400 years? Um, and, you know, and at the same time, like, it, it, it's it better, better late than never, I guess, right? And I think part of what we have to, like, have the courage to do is to not have the answers and to not know what to do and to stumble our way through it, right? And to not be afraid to make mistakes and to own them when we do and to just keep chugging along, you know? So, Chris, I don't know if there's anything you wanna say before we... Well, I'm reminded of an experience I had when I was uh, on a peace team project in Palestine with an organization called Christian Peacemaker Teams. And we were just a, a tiny little motley little crew of people who were there to try to offer some kind of service to families in Hebron under occupation. And my first stint there, um, a, f a few times people came to me and said, why is your group so small? Where are the others? And I really let that hit me, you know, of like, we are just this tiny little group of people in a country of millions and millions of able-bodied people who, who could have made the choice to put their bodies in that situation. And I just want to like name that. And I, and I name this for myself and other people who are white identifying people that what I, what I hear in your, in your comment as a white person, it immediately brings to mind my own addiction to comfort. And I think that is part of the opportunity we have now is to really evaluate kind of what Kazu was saying about what's effective. When, when you ask that question, then it, it forces us to ask, well, what are we really after? What do we really long for? What is our goal really? And if we let ourselves ask that question, I think we'll have to have a, a good wrestling match with our addiction to comfort. And I'm saying our, 
for folks like me who experience that. I don't mean that uh, to ascribe that to every white bodied person on this call, but I, I have noticed that it's, it's a, it's a malady that many white bodied people are dealing with. Thank you, Elaine. Lee Tsun. Hi. I have a couple of questions and if you would be able to either of you answer to whichever one speaks to you, I'd be so grateful. Um, one of the questions that's been coming up for me in this conversation is around the difference between harm and violence. And, you know, Kazu, I've heard you speak before to, and as you did today, that nonviolence is something that we work towards. It's a North Star that we navigate towards rather than something that we become. Um, so knowing that that is something that's to guide us, you know, I'm really curious about examples that you see now that you would consider to be um, harm but not violence, uh, especially in this moment where there's a lot of like call out and canceling happening. I feel my personal experience is that sometimes there's harm which can be repaired in a different way than violence itself. Um, but I would just like to hear from you all since you know more about this. And then my other question is, um, my other question is, you know, I've been spending a lot of this time re-educating myself around the history of the police state so I can better engage with this present moment to abolish the police. And one of the things I've come to understand is that the formation of the police is a system organized violence created by the state particularly once slavery was abolished. So it's like, it's an organized system of violence. And I've also heard you all talk before about how our level of nonviolence needs to match the level of violence. And I was really curious if you have any examples of organized systems of nonviolence that have existed and can guide us and be inspirations for us to know that they've also been living the way that systems of violence have been living. Chris, you want to go first or? Go for it. Um, first of all, we don't know more than anyone on this call, so I'm, <laughs> that feels like pressure. Um, yeah, I mean, around policing, because there's uh, another question from uh, someone around that too. Uh, so maybe I'll try to like merge a response to both of those questions. Um, yeah, so as many people probably know by now, the institution of policing in this country, a part of it is rooted in um, the slave patrol. After, uh, uh, during slavery, when slaves would run away, they set up these systems to go catch these slaves and bring them back to their, their masters. Um, and that is one of the, the roots of the police. And even in Oakland, where I live, uh, I'm assuming several of us are in Oakland, um, the Oakland Police Department really grew when there was a lot of migration of Black folks from the South to work in the, the ports in Oakland. And they actually went to the South and recruited white people and brought them to Oakland and hired them as the, some of the original officers of Oakland Police Department because they had experience kind of policing Black people. And so um, it's, it's impossible to to separate out that lineage, that legacy with institutional police now. And I mean, as far as nonviolent institutions, there's not as many examples that have been institutionalized at the same level as the US military or the police department, right? Um, there are examples of attempts to institutionalize nonviolence within police departments. Um, people may have mixed uh, beliefs about that, but for example, the Providence, Rhode Island, um, all of their police officers at one point were trained in Kingian nonviolence. The Miami-Dade Sheriff's Department at one point had 300 officers who were trained as trainers in Kingian nonviolence. And those are examples where you can see statistically the rate of violence, including not just like police violence, but the rate of violence in the community dropped dramatically. And specifically in the uh, example of the Miami-Dade Police Department, they realized because there was a, there was, it was during a, a time when there were a lot of riots going on in Miami area, and they realized that once the police were trained in nonviolence, the violence that was that they thought was starting in the community also dropped. 
right? Because it turns out that the police was largely responsible for instigating a lot of the violence. Um, I can also think of examples like uh, nonviolent peace force and Christian peacemaker teams uh, that Chris has mentioned and Gilda on the call is part of, who train masses of people in nonviolent peacekeeping and send them into conflict regions um, as, a, as an alternative to the military. So there's uh, things like that. Um, Chris may have other examples. And just kind of one last thing uh, back to police systems and, and how we work to how we work with police systems, how we work with police at systems level with Black Lives Matter. Um, I, I've done a lot of work with law enforcement and I have sat in circles with law enforcement. Sorry, my phone is speaking to me again. Um, and it's really helped me to like humanize their experience and to see that actually it's it's interesting um having done some trauma healing work with prison guards they say the same exact things as the people the incarcerated people that i work with like they have very similar experiences um so i think part of it is learning to hear their stories and humanizing their experience and, and acknowledging that the system of policing is violent towards everybody Right? Like when we live with systems of violence, nobody's free from that experience and the system of policing hurts police officers as well. Um, and at the same time, in doing restorative dialogues, one of the things that I've learned is that you can't rush two people who have experienced harm together into a circle too quickly. Like the prep work that it takes to get those two sides to come to the table is probably more important than any sort of facilitation that happens when the two sides come together. And I actually don't know if bringing those two sides together, the police and Black Lives Matter movement, is actually the most effective thing right now. I, I think there will be a time for that later on. Um, but I think uh, I, I get the sense that right now, um, w the country isn't ready for that dialogue. So like, what are we doing in the streets that allows us to, to kind of like get the most out of this, this moment, uh, this opportunity of defunding the police and all of that. And at the same time, sowing the seeds for that dialogue to be possible in the future. Um, so I feel like I just rambled and didn't actually directly respond to your question too much, but i um, wondering if Chris has any thoughts on that. Uh, well, in response to your, your second question, I wanna, I'm just kind of noting the time too, and kind of to cut to the chase, I'm gonna put a book in the, chat that I found super helpful in terms of um, offering examples of communities that were coming up with new ways of approaching resolving you know serious uh, conflict and uh, without resorting to the police um, really powerful restorative justice and transformative conflict uh, transformation kind of uh, experiments uh, locked down, locked out by Maya Shenwar. So Lisa and I encourage you to like check that out if you can. And I, I want to actually just quickly throw the, the first question back to you, Lisa, and just for a clarification, because it, it felt really important what you were getting at, the difference between harm and, and violence. And I wanted to just make sure I was understanding what you were saying. Can you just give me an example of what you meant, like when you said harm that happens without violence? Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's easy for me to think of interpersonal examples of this, but really I'm interested in like how you think about this on a more systemic level. Um, but I can think of interpersonal situations of somebody, um, I mean, I, I'll just use an I statement. I think that feels a little safer that when people, have, someone said something to me that has felt harmful, um, that I would not consider violent, but that I consider problematic. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Even that distinction helps me, I think, understand what you're getting at. And I, I think I understand too how you had referred to cancel culture or sort of call out culture within the question. Um, it's a big topic and we have three minutes left. <laughs> um, 
I guess for me, I just want to name that harm um, and violence to me are, are usually, in my experience, are usually coming together. Um, and that when, when we're talking about um, harm that happens when it wasn't intentional, when there wasn't, um, when there wasn't aggression on, on the part of the person who causes the harm, to me, it's, it's super helpful to distinguish those, those times. Kazu and I have talked about this in terms of microaggressions, how, how even the, the word microaggression implies that when someone does a microaggression that they're being aggressive, when sometimes those microaggressions happen with the person actually having good intentions. There might be an intention to connect, but because they don't, they haven't developed the awareness around perhaps the language they use, that their attempt to connect, to actually build a bridge towards relationship could actually cause harm. And I do think it's very important to distinguish between that. And this is where the, the balancing of intention and impact is so important for us to, to be really honest with. And I think as a, as a kind of general rule, to err on the side of tending to the impact, regardless of our intention is key. And that when we see the kind of experiments and restorative justice that are happening that kind of shine a light on another way of doing this, I think we see that there is that built into it, the inclination to look and, and tend to the harm that's been done regardless of intent. Cause I'm gonna just pass that one to you if you have any like kind of last remarks about it before we, before we close. Yeah, within the Kingian world, there's the official Kingian definition for violence, which is actually physical or emotional harm. So within that Kingian definition, I don't think there is a distinction made. And, and I tend to kind of agree with Chris. I, I, I wonder if the distinction isn't um, as important as like how we respond to it, right? Like what you're calling harm, I think um, you know, sometimes be, like because we live in this world where nuance no longer exists, anything that is harm or violence is just put in this bucket as this is violent, period. And therefore, the response to violence has to be with a certain level of escalation. And perhaps because of that, we have a tendency to respond to what you're describing as harm um, in a way that um, like as if it was the most egregious thing in the world. And it becomes a less skillful response to that. So I think we definitely need to have some awareness of like the scale of harm, right? Because again, like the scale of our response has to match the scale of the harm. And oh, this is something we we're talking about earlier before you, you came on, I think. And I, and I think sometimes we take something like a police killing of an unarmed black person and say, well, we need to fill a petition and that's not the appropriate response. But at the same time, I think sometimes we take something like a microaggression and respond to it in a way as if it was the most egregious, most violent thing that has ever happened. And that's not a skillful response either. And so I think just um, really being aware of what the kind of escalation level is and how much harm was done. And that requires us to be in deep relationship with the person that received harm and to really hear their impact and their story. Um, and to figure out skillful responses to that. So I apologize that we didn't get to a lot of these questions, but um, definitely look forward to continuing to be in community with you all. We'll send uh, follow-up emails with some additional resources. And so I think with that, I'll, I'll um, hand it back to Astrid for um, us to close, but want to thank you all for joining us. And it's really good to see many old faces and some new faces and look forward to seeing you all again. Chris, I don't know if you have anything you want to say for closing and then we'll hand it back to Astrid. Yeah, just feeling a lot of gratitude for this, for this time with you all. And um, thank you, Kazu, for being such a great conversation partner and, and teammate in this work. This one. Thank you so much to the both of you. It's been a pleasure. It's been 
immensely interesting and I hope that all of you are taking something out of this call. If you want to save the chat, uh, I assume that you can click on the three dots at the bottom of your chat and save the chat uh, because there are a lot of resources that were put in the chat. So you can do that before leaving. And um, if as you're exiting, you want to say thank you or bye, feel free to unmute yourself. Thank you so much for coming um, and take care. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank, Thank you, Anita. You. <laughs> Good Bye. to see you, Astrid. Bye. Good work. Hey, Anita. Great to see you. Great work. All these beautiful faces. Yeah. Be well. Wow.